Hi, I'm Corey Malcolm and I'm the Director of Archaeology for the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum in Key West, Florida. This is a presentation about a shipwreck survey that turned into something else entirely. A few years ago, we were working with the RPM Nautical Foundation and searching a reef uh, west of Key West here for shipwrecks. The discoveries we made, though, were surprising and much more ancient than any shipwreck we might have found. It was a fascinating lesson in always being prepared to expect the unexpected I hope you enjoy this talk, and I'm certain you're going to learn something new about the underwater world. This video describes what was meant to be research into the wrecked slave ship Henrietta Marie. A survey intended to locate missing portions of the Henrietta Marie was conducted at New Ground Reef, where it was lost. But the work revealed little new about the slaver. Instead, completely unforeseen discoveries were made. The project was a stark lesson in always being prepared for an investigation to reveal the unexpected. New Ground Reef is in the far western Florida Keys and is centered roughly 35 miles west of Key West, Florida. New Ground is unusual in that it is a reef on the north side of the Keys and it's in the extreme southeastern Gulf of Mexico rather than directly fronting the Florida Channel and Gulf Stream Current. This is where the wreck of the Henrietta Marie is located. The Henrietta Marie was a London-based ship engaged in its second voyage as a transatlantic slaver. In 1972, the Henrietta Marie was found by Treasure Salvers Incorporated during the search for the wreck of the 1622 galleon Nuestra Señora de Atocha. Artifacts were recovered and though its identity was not known at the time, Evidence quickly showed the wreck was English, later than Atocha, and likely a slave ship. Between 1983 and 2001, formal archaeological research was conducted at the site. It was during this time that the ship's watch bell was discovered, cast with the Henrietta Marie, 1699. With a name and date for the shipwreck, specific historical research could be conducted. It was found that a group of London businessmen organized the Henrietta Marie for its second slaving voyage. They loaded the ship with a variety of English goods for trade in Africa. The Henrietta Marie left London in September of 1699 bound for West Africa. The ship most likely went to New Calabar in today's Nigeria. There, the crew traded European goods for people. It then carried the cargo of newly acquired captive Africans to Jamaica. 191 people were sold to plantation owners there. The Henrietta Marie then loaded with a cargo of sugar for the return voyage to England. During that journey, it disappeared in unknown circumstances. The research into the Henrietta Marie's recovered artifacts tells a chilling story of the physical realities of the transatlantic slave trade. Trade goods such as pewterware, glass beads, and iron bars were carried, all meant to be exchanged for people. Once those people were on board, they were put in iron shackles, two by two, so they couldn't escape their captivity or rise against the Henrietta Marie's crew. Eighty-two sets of shackles have been recovered, enough to hold 164 people. 
There's also a section of the ship's hull that survives buried under the seabed to tell of its size and design. The Henrietta Marie was a relatively small vessel at 120 tons. In 1993, a monument dedicated to the Africans forced to sail on the ship was placed at the wreck site by the National Association of Black Scuba Divers. The Henrietta Marie has proved to be a powerful historical and archaeological resource, and it has shaped public perception about the transatlantic slave trade. But what has been found on the wreck is at best half of the ship. Historical and archaeological evidence show that many items are missing, including most of the ship's hull and six iron cannons. If the mystery of where the rest of the Henrietta Marie is located could be solved and new information discovered, it would answer many questions about not only the ship, but the transatlantic slave trade in general. In 1998, the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum and the RPM Nautical Foundation began surveys in the areas around the Henrietta Marie. Upon review, though, the survey was found to be inconsistent and it lacked the precision to accurately produce repeatable results. A new survey was needed to build upon the clues from the 1998 work, but to be performed in a more formal and structured fashion. New Ground Reef is remote and not well known, not even today. It wasn't even formally recognized until the mid-1800s. In addition to the Henrietta Marie, there are other shipwrecks, mostly from the 1800s, that might have been lost at New Ground and could possibly be found during any survey. In 2001, a permit to survey new ground in its surrounding areas was applied for and granted by the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. This survey was based on the use of magnetometers with the idea that iron from the Henrietta Marie or other shipwrecks would cause localized disturbances in the Earth's natural magnetic field and these anomalies would be detectable by the magnetometers. The RPM Nautical Foundation's research vessel, Lakota, was outfitted with three magnetometers. Each of the towed devices was spaced five meters apart to form a 10 meter wide swath. The survey vessel traveled in east-west lanes spaced at 15 meters ensuring that one magnetic sensor passed over every five meters of the survey area. Those tracks were kept straight and even by using special navigation software. Live magnetometer data readouts were monitored on board. Early in the survey, side scan sonar units were used too, but it was quickly found that Newground has far too many coral heads and rocky features for side scan imaging to be effective. There was simply too much natural noise. In and around the area of the Henrietta Marie, many dozens of magnetic anomalies were revealed. Some of these hits were compelling because they looked much like what was expected of the shipwreck, particularly trails of wreckage or a jumble of iron cannons. Divers examined these anomalies. Many times, the sources were easily identifiable and largely proved to be things like anchors or commercial fishing gear. But just as often, the source of the anomaly could not be seen. These hits were detectable with a handheld magnetometer, but they were buried. Over the course of the survey, 18 of these buried anomalies were considered interesting enough because of their intensity and proximity to the Henrietta Marie that permission was sought and granted to uncover and identify them. 
In August of 2002, excavation commenced at a large anomaly in 45 feet of water approximately one mile south of the Henrietta Marie. Once the specific point was found on the seabed and delineated, the excavation was conducted with four and six inch water fed dredges. Shortly after digging started, a small blue bead was discovered. It was identical to a type of glass bead found on the Henrietta Marie. This was very encouraging. Surely, part of the shipwreck lay below. Many black rocks were also found. They were odd, but what were they? Stone ballast from the ship? At a depth of five feet into the seabed, a piece of wood was found. Was it from the shipwreck? The crew's excitement grew. The bottom of the hole was carefully cleared, which revealed more wood and a layer of peat. Nothing looked man-made, but what could it be? Was it shipwreck related or was it natural? Samples were recovered. The wood proved to be yellow pine and red mangrove. Some of the wood was burned. A pine cone was found. Oyster shells indicated an intertidal environment. Other samples were collected for carbon-14 dating analysis. The carbon-14 date was quite surprising. It showed the site was around 8,500 years old. Additionally, the black rocks were found to be burned limestone. The excavation didn't reveal a shipwreck, but rather something prehistoric involving fire. With that strange and unexpected discovery and the ending of good summer weather, the work stopped. In the summer of 2003, the project resumed. There was still a belief that the large, complicated anomaly might still be the site of Henrietta Marie wreckage, so the decision was made to continue exploring it. The area was relocated with the handheld magnetometer and the magnetic distribution plotted in detail with a magnetic gradiometer. First, the 2002 area was plotted. Then, to the south of it, another magnetic lobe was discovered and it too was plotted. This secondary feature was chosen for examination. Excavation at the second area uncovered a similar layer of peat or organic soil at the same depth, five feet, as the previous year's discovery. Samples were collected from this feature. There was more blackened limestone. There were sarith shells, barnacles, calcareous halameda algae. There were murex shells, tulips, more oysters. All of these shell samples were from shallow water creatures and it looked again like a natural site bearing evidence of fire. The team moved to examine another spot that was one in a line of anomalies leading towards the Henrietta Marie and it appeared to be a trail of shipwreck debris. This site too revealed only blackened limestone and there were no contacts made with the metal detector. There was nothing metallic there. In September of 2003, the crew moved to uncover a fourth anomaly. This one was closer to the Henrietta Marie. Once again, the excavation revealed only blackened rocks and charcoal. At this fourth site, the excavation reached a depth of 11 feet without hitting bedrock. There was no chance the Henrietta Marie had penetrated or been covered by so much densely packed sediment.
That fact, along with the blackened rock and charcoal indicating a natural cause, along with a growing safety concern for the excavation crew, warranted the abandonment of the excavation. With the good weather of the summer field season nearing its end and all hopes of finding shipwreck materials being stymied by apparently natural magnetic anomalies, this dig was the last for 2003 and ultimately of the project. Every anomaly that was investigated in these test excavations held evidence of ancient fires particularly on low pinelands where land met shallow sea some 8,500 years ago. Why was this happening? Part of the answer lies in phenomena called the Curie temperature and thermoremanent magnetism. The Curie temperature is the point at which heat fluctuation breaks up the ordering of the magnetically susceptible elements of a substance. When heated, these components fall out of magnetic alignment and the substance loses its magnetic properties. When the substance is cooled, its magnetic properties will return, but aligned under the influence of the prevailing magnetic field. This is an effect known as thermoremnant magnetism. When the bed of limestone was laid at New Ground Reef, as it accrued by sedimentation, any magnetically susceptible materials aligned with the Earth's prevailing magnetic field. When the stone was heated to its Curie temperature, the magnetic materials at the point of the heat source lost that alignment. But when the heat source was extinguished and the stone cooled, those susceptible materials realigned with the then current Earth's magnetic field. Because the Earth's magnetic field is not static, it wanders, the realigned magnetism of the heated area was likely different than that of when the rock bed was originally laid. And because the Earth's magnetic poles have continued to shift since then, the heated area is different again from today's magnetic field. The localized heat-induced magnetic realignment is an anomaly that is readily detected by a magnetometer. Limestone, composed of calcium carbonate, is not inherently magnetic, but it can contain impurities that are. Iron-rich African dust regularly blows across the Atlantic and can be incorporated into limestone. Plants and plant ash can also concentrate iron compounds. So, thermoremnant magnetism is likely the cause of the magnetic anomalies at Newground, but why are they 50 feet underwater? The mechanism that led to such a seemingly incongruous situation lies in glacial and interglacial cycles. For billions of years, the Earth has undergone varying stages of heating and cooling, and with these fluctuating phases, Seas rise and fall because of the alternating formation and melting of huge continental glaciers. In a glacial period, mile-thick sheets of ice cover land masses. There's so much water held in solid form over ground that sea levels fall. In an interglacial period, temperatures increase and the warming causes the glaciers to melt. This meltwater fills the seas, and they rise. These periods of warming, cooling, and flooding are cyclical, and they're driven largely by irregularities in the Earth's orbit and axial positioning. This linkage was first described by Serbian geophysicist Milutin Milankovic, who found that variations in the eccentricity of Earth's orbit around the Sun, the obliquity or axial tilt, and the orbital precession or wobble occur at regular intervals, 
and these changes affect the amount of solar energy that reaches the planet. When solar light and heat increase, it causes the ice sheets to melt. Around 22,000 years ago, Earth was very cold with huge, thick glaciers covering much of the land. With so much water locked up in ice, sea levels were around 400 feet lower than today. With the sea level so much lower, Florida was a much bigger place at the last glacial maximum. But as orbital cycles changed and northern climes began to receive increased sunlight, the glaciers melted and seas rose rapidly from that low. The rising waters began to slow around 8,000 years ago and then became relatively stable around 6,000 years ago. This bathymetric chart shows how the larger Florida landmass would have been slowly inundated, especially along the relatively shallow western shelf in the Gulf of Mexico. This sea level rise explains how the ancient forest fires discovered in the New Ground Survey are now found 50 feet underwater. The patterns of the magnetic anomalies at Newground might hold clues as to how this inundation occurred. Many of the anomalies are arranged in long lines, often running parallel to each other. The thinking is that as the low land was inundated, the water created long, thin strands of land in alignment with its flow. Or, alternately, the area may have been an early extension of the Everglades, with a sheet of shallow fresh water flowing across the land toward the ocean, creating a similar effect. The interiors of these skinny islands, being dry, were susceptible to fires from lightning strikes or even human activity. Today, the history of fires on those strand islands shows as lines of thermoremnant magnetic anomalies. Though the rest of the Henrietta Marie was not located, the magnetic survey at New Ground Reef has opened a new avenue of research. The New Ground area is a repository of well-preserved traces of ancient Florida and these sites tell of the ecology of the ancient paleo landscape. Though they're not at all what was expected or intended at the outset of the new ground survey, these unusual finds add a new and important dimension to the concept and understanding of the maritime past as it is found in the waters of the Florida Keys.